We're having a conversation today regarding business best practices with Chris Hafner of Franklin Strength and Wellness. Chris, you're a coach, a trainer, and what's your actual title at Franklin Strength? Yeah, so I'm the GM of Franklin Strength. I'm also the coach, a co like head coach and trainer, among other things. And what, what year did the business get started? The original Franklin Strength launched probably about eight years ago. I came down in 2019. They brought me on as the general manager to kind of like change the direction of the business. And then the business was just sold in 2021. And now the business is rocking and rolling and we're making some really good strides. From a individual standpoint, we look at you, we look at your career. How long have you been training? How long have you been a coach? I've been doing this since uh, you were my first personal training uh, mentor and, and boss back in, I was in college after the military. So I was probably about 22 years old. So I've been doing this, I'm almost 37 now. So I've been doing this close to 15 years. So 15 years in the industry and pieces that I find interesting as I talk to more coaches, trainers, gym owners is the fact that most people only make it a couple of years in the industry. So the fact that you're at year, we'll call it 15, it is rather significant. And you kind of migrated from just coaching and training to now being on the operations side. And, and we talked a little bit before we got started today. So the business was originally Franklin Strength and Conditioning, correct? Correct. And you guys are down outside Nashville and Tennessee. Yep, we live, we're in Franklin. There was a play on the name Franklin, which for those of you that are, are struggling, trying to figure out your business, if you're going to have a brick and mortar and you're going to have a somewhat single or somewhat singular geographical location, there can be value in plugging something like Franklin and strength and wellness, because it, it's a one statement elevator speech that says what you do. And it says where you are, which makes you very easy to be found by folks that live in that geography. Now the strength and conditioning, so conditioning fell off and then you guys added wellness. Talk a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so our main focus was to shift our business to uh, more personal training, semi-private training and small group versus having these larger, larger group, you know, training sessions with 15 to 25 people on there. We realized that in order to actually have a sustainable business and actually able to provide value for our, our clients to kind of downsize everything. And that included our space. So we went from probably a 3,500 square foot facility to a thousand square foot facility now. It's awesome. It is, it, it's the best decision we ever made. And you guys made that move recently. That was just like this calendar year, correct? Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a tough process though. So we moved probably about two and a half months ago, finally, but it was, it was a journey. You know, we went through trying to find a space to lease and in Franklin, it's super bougie, super expensive. So you're, you know, you're looking at these tiny little thousand square foot spots or 2000 square foot spots. And you're looking at a pretty high price tag. So we had to find the right spot for us, for our budget. But then also we wanted to be super high end, super clean. You could eat off the floor. And we've seen this with other business owners we've talked to and regardless of industry is you guys kind of acknowledge that maybe going smaller, maybe going deeper, maybe not trying to be all things to all people, eliminating that that larger group experience would be an opportunity in a profitable one. You got smaller to actually get bigger, it sounds like. Yeah. So our goal was to increase our average revenue per member versus just getting a ton of people in there paying, you know, next to nothing for their, their, their membership, which probably doesn't mean much to them anyways, right? They're coming in at a higher price tag. We're pro providing a higher value service for these people. And they're staying with, with us ideally for a longer period of time of, of time as well, because we're, we're showing them, Hey, you can do this. You can make progress. And this is also an enjoyable experience. It should be part of your life. Another example of gotten smaller, gotten a lot clearer on what you want to provide and in doing so, it's going to allow you to grow. The other thing is how long do you keep your customers? So that's something we've been focusing on and trying to improve, right? So keep in mind, we just moved two months ago. So things are going to change. People are going to stay with us longer. We now have air conditioning and heat, you know, all the, uh, all the things that you would think a gym would normally have, but our, pr our prior facility, you know, we didn't have any of that. So in middle Tennessee in the summertime, it gets real hot. So we would, you know, we'd have people come and go throughout the year. Like right now, we'd probably have people stay with us for a body close to a year. And we're trying to get to the point where they're staying with us longer than that. So 18 months, two years, three years. And I've got some personal training clients, as you know, from your, your past training experiences, people want to work with us. And generally they're going to stay with us for a long period of time because we're providing that value for them. Our small group and our semi-private setup now that's becoming more, more of a reality. So I'm thinking this, this time that our, that our clients stay with us is going to be increased. We kind of moved our brick and mortar business model away from 
the one-on-one -on -one coaching and training into group training. We offered large group and in small group and still did some one-on-one. -on -one. What was interesting is we would retain our one-on-one -on -one clients for three or four months. They would sign up for three workouts a week, one-on-one -on -one with a coach or trainer. Three months, they'd run out of cash. It was like lifetime cash for coaching and training. We mm -hmm. shifted the business model. The average retention went up to almost 24 months. So I think you're spot on. You're going to see that 18 to 24 months. The other banana Anna's thing. There's people we signed up in 2012 under that model that are still training today. The lifetime value of the client is is significant. So, and it sounds like you guys are, are starting to, to really take advantage of that. And then, I mean, talk a little bit about delivering results to that smaller group client versus that really, you know, that 12 to 18 group client. Like, are you seeing people make better progress? realize more goals, that type stuff? Well, I, I mean, keep in mind that we've only been in our new space for a couple months now. Um, we've been able to improve all of our systems in the last year, but then really be able to apply these systems in this, this new space because everything's kind of set up to how we want it to be now. So for example, doing a lot of things that we should have been doing this whole time. We're not perfect. We learn along the way. Just an example that pops off is, uh, goal reviews. So now we're, we're sitting down with our, our clients every 90 days and we're doing a goal review with them. So that means we can either refine their prior goal, right? And really, really hone in on that or change it up completely so that we can continue to keep them motivated. And that's been, that's been really helpful. So I could assume that Ray, you're coming with me, you're coming to train with me because you want to increase the size of your calves and upper arms, right? We all know that, Kate, that Ray has some great upper arms and calves. You know, Ray might have some other goals. Like for example, he might want to uh, work on some sort of deadlift progression to get his lower back super strong so that he can ride more motocross with his son, right? Something like that. These goal reviews are kind of opening up windows for us so that we can not only improve what their service is being, you know, how it's being delivered, but also like we can make sure that, that they're actually working towards something that they value. Um, not just implying that their goal is to get stronger or build more muscle. And that's pretty intuitive on your guys' part. And we saw that with our staff. We would always remind our coaches and trainers that we, you know, we really need to communicate with clients and make sure we understand what it is that they're buying from us. Like, like you said, not everybody wants big biceps. Not everybody wants to look great in a bathing suit. It could be, hey, I want to fix my low back. I want to be able to go do stuff with my kids and grandkids. What's really cool is that you guys are making time to focus on goals. You don't hear a lot of clubs, coaches, and trainers that have systemized following up. You know, like, hey, Mary, is last time we met, these were the things you wanted to work towards. Where are you in in your opinion in regards to, to getting right. closer to reaching that? And have have things changed and we've got check-ins along the way as well some people check in week we check in weekly with some people some people are maybe every four to six weeks something like that they're not just you know we're not just setting the goal and then touching base in 90 days we're actually following up with them throughout the course of that that 90 day block of time so that uh, we can help and modify things if need what do you what are you doing for the check-ins are they in person we either do them over the phone or facetime if you like generally it seems like it's easier to schedule for not only the coach but also people how long are those appointments in 10 minutes yeah, we, 15 minutes or 30 you're looking at 30 or less. Uh, depends how, you know, some people are very, very quick and some people are really, you know, involved. We try to pull as much out of, out of them as we can. Uh, usually 30 minutes is going to be our cat. What's the average frequency that you're doing that check-in? Every 90 days for the goal review, an average on like a check-in throughout the course of that block of time would be probably every couple weeks. It could be a quick text message or a touch base in person, you know, maybe briefly talk about Let's say it's a nutrition-based related goal. They might send you their average like protein macros for the week or something like that. For people that are tuned in, that are looking kind of like you guys are to retain clients for a longer period of time, I, I think that's one easy way to do it is to follow up, make sure that the client is getting what they want out of the relationship and not guessing, you know, and, right. and if, if their goals have changed, well, you should probably be aware of that. Make sure that if you need to do something different, you are, otherwise they're going to leave. Right. I tell our clients, it's like, listen, this is like, our, this is our livelihood. So if you don't make progress, we're not going to be able to have a business. So our incentive for you to make progress is it's everything. So like I'm providing for my family and my coaches are providing for their family. They're earning a living doing what they enjoy. If our clients aren't making progress, then we're kind of out of luck. So small group and semi-private, are they the same thing or what's different between those? So we offer three different things, right? We got personal train, training, so that's one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, semi-private is anywhere up to three people. So we cap those, those semi-private groups at three people. 
And generally, uh, we'll have two in the semi-private group. There's going to be a, a time where we're able to grow one, to, grow them to three as well. But you know, we've noticed that for semi-private groups, having two people, one coach to two people, it's a great ratio. And then our small group training is generally around six, no more than eight. And are you guys selling it as a package, or are you doing it as a membership? That's that's a great question. For our all of our personal training, essentially, our personal training or semi-private training, I just kind of use those one the same, right? It's a subscription-based model. So this is a big thing that a lot of trainers struggle with. Uh, late cancellations or people just being flaky, right? So how we set everything up, and this is part of the, you know, creating systems side of the business. We set it up so that essentially people come in, they do something called onboarding with us, where we get them kind of set up for success for whatever venture they go on, whether that's small group or semi-private or personal training. But once they're actually training with us, they set it up so that they're they're billed effectively every four weeks, right? Let's say they train uh, eight sessions um, every four weeks with us, so two two sessions a week. Well, they're reserving that day and those days and times in with your coach. Essentially, it comes down to they need to they need to show up, right? Or they lose the session. So they're not we're not rescheduling sessions. We're not um, worrying about people if our if they're going to not show up or they're going to cancel. The coach's time is secured. Also, a good thing for the client because the client's already paid for it, so they might as well show up because then they're going to make more progress and they're going to reach their goals quicker. And that was one of the big shifts we made at the tail end of the recession business model wise and we five or six x our training revenue so we were you know we were able to generate 35 40 thousand a month in service revenue and the way we did it was it was very similar to what you did clients begin to show up they they're more accountable the employees are going to get paid so we were able to give our employees 35 40 hours a week of coaching and training hours wow you know, if someone no showed it, nobody showed up, it didn't matter. You know, we had revenue coming in so we could still pay the staff. So they were, you know, they were happy. They were able to go buy a car, go get a mortgage and they could show, you know, documented consistent income. I talked to a lot of the the coaches and even small gyms, they still struggle with this. It's like, listen, just why wake up on the first of the month and wonder how much training revenue you're going to bring in. Build a system that brings in, like you said, subscription. We typically call it a membership model, just sell your service as a subscription or membership. And then every month, you know, you're going to have some revenue coming in and for your customers, they're more likely to show up. So that's for our personal training. It's more of a subscription based model. And then our, our small group training, I would, I would classify more as a membership based model. So they're paying $199 a month, right? And they can train as many, uh, they can come to as many small group sessions as they like. But with all of those things, right, there is a, uh, we have a cancellation policy built in. We're not, we're not going to stress if someone cancels the, the day before their membership renews because we have a cancellation policy which protects us from that so that essentially you know their cancellation policy they it effectively fills them for their last month which they can still attend their sessions or their classes right it helps us out not st- you know stressing about losing three or four people at the end of a month and these are things that you know for time and memorial the fitness industry in a lot of ways it's still in its infancy when you look at the lack of regular business systems everything we just talked about is a receivable base which which most businesses have. There's a system that allows most businesses to look at next month and project and forecast what the revenue is. In the fitness industry, we've had cancel any time. We've had people buy personal training, buy a 10 pack, a 20 pack. Then they don't show up in the trainers there. So now that do you pay the trainer or the pay, trainer doesn't get paid? Someone's not getting paid and they're at work. At some point, they got to go get another job. And then you look at the benefit to the customer. Like, well, if you're not coming in, you're not going to get any results. It's it's great that you guys are behaving like a business and have started to and continue to build systems that are, are real business systems. And I've noticed that for whatever reason, people treat the fitness industry just differently. So they, they just think that, uh, you know, they can come in and get some crazy discount for whatever reason. A lot of people, especially the clients coming into most facilities, probably around the country, they're just kind of, they don't really look at uh, the fitness industry like they would, let's say, go into a restaurant. Well, I've never gone to a restaurant or steakhouse and being like, oh, is that okay to pay next week? I, I, I bought a really expensive steak today, but I'll pay next week. It'll be fine. It's, it's cool to actually like turn this fitness in, like from our perspective, right? We're treating it like a business because you mentioned earlier, it's our livelihood, but then people start to respect you for that because you're, you're providing a, a great service for them. That's going to be life-changing, but at the same time, it's like, Hey, listen, you know, we're going to protect our, our staff, right? We're going to protect our facility. We're going to make this thing happen. We're going to be around for a long period of time. And I look at that, the industry gets treated that way 
and it's our fault. It's the people in the industry that are continuing to do things the way the fitness industry was doing them really in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Back when the health club industry, commercial health clubs started to become a thing, the industry was brand new. And the people that were starting health clubs, the people working in the industry, for the most part, they were bodybuilders or former athletes. They weren't business folks. We're in the 2000s. It's 2022 at the time we're doing this. It's the industry's fault. People should be behaving like a business. And it's up to the owners. It's up to somebody like you, the GM, to kind of start to set what that culture is and then be willing to stand behind it. It is tough, though. I do see why it is challenging for some business owners or gym owners is because the basically the turnover of staff is is very, generally very high unless you can actually create a career for that staff member, which is our which is our goal. We, we're a very small staff. We have the owner and then we have myself and then I have two coaches. Say, let's say I'm not able to uh, create a good wage for my coaches. Well, they're not going to stick around or they're not going to do a great job like I expect them to do, like I'm doing. And then that's going to be a bad reflection on your business. So you're paying your coach as well, but it also helps with retention for those coaches. One of my coaches, I told him, I said, my goal is to to, to get you to the point where you're, you're making enough money to where you're not going to have to worry about money ever again. That's that's my goal with you. And he's like, okay, I'm, I'm down for that. He has been the best staff member I've ever had in my life. He's phenomenal. And keep in mind, I, I was in the military for a long time. I, I worked with a lot of different people in, in different leadership levels. You know, this guy and my other my other coach, a gal, she's she's phenomenal as well. It's like we've got the right people in the right place. And now we just got to continue to to rock and roll. And I encourage other gym owners out there to really search for the right people, but then tr train them to how you want things to, to occur in the business, but then reward them for their for their great job. So you're paying them you're not paying them $10 an hour, right? We're paying our coaches anywhere between, you know, it depends on, on the setup, but they're making anywhere between 30 and $90 an hour based on they're doing, you know, small group classes or semi-private training, whatever it may be. So that's that's a great living for a coach. And you don't even necessarily need to work 40 hours a week. I'm, I'm not going to work 40 hours this week, maybe close to it, but uh, I'm going to try to keep it, keep it under that, you know? We got forced to change our business models. I mean, the recession sucked $50,000 in revenue out in three months. I realized if we continued, we were in trouble. At that point in time, payroll could be 20, 24,000 a pay period, which was twice a month. Rent was 15 grand. So I, I was realizing I'm going to be in trouble. And it was the first three months of the year. So we should have been making good money. And the other thing that happened is I had a, a service provider that worked for us and she went to the car dealership to buy a car and calls me for two reasons. She didn't have her pay stub. So she needed to figure out how to log into our payroll system. But then two, her revenue changed every month because if she had a lot of clients, she made good money. But if it was a slow month, there wasn't a lot of money because if she didn't have a client, she didn't get paid. She puts me on the phone or puts it on speaker. And so I can tell the salesman, and the guy in the finance office, what she makes. And and this was many years ago. So this isn't a lot of money today, but she would make mid forties. It wasn't bad money, especially oh. for somebody at, at her age back then. The problem is every check for her was different. So she could have a check where she just, you know, for two weeks, a lot of clients, no showed whatever it might be. You know, it was like, I got to fix this. I have good people that are passionate that want to do this, but they can't make a living. You know, there's two things that I've learned. One, when you lose employees, it's very expensive. That's the most expensive thing your business is going to go through is, is replacing an employee, especially if they're good a good employee. And the other thing is help them make enough money to live and give them opportunities to grow. They stick around and they over deliver to your customers. Hey, I don't know if you remember this, Ray, before I started personal training for you, I actually worked alongside you when I was in high school. They uh, One of the uh, front desk staff members. Do you remember that? But you worked for Paul, but yeah. A big, a big thing I learned from you and Paul is that relationships are everything. Like if you can nurture relationships and, and build it with your staff members or, or your clients, whatever, your life is going to be so much more rewarding. I remember seeing you guys, you'd have people come in, you'd have hundreds of people come to that gym. I, don't, I couldn't even tell you how many people people came to that gym, but they all knew, they all knew you guys, you all knew something about them. You know, at the time you probably didn't, didn't think anything of it. It was great to see that because now what I try to do is I try to make sure that like, I get to know my people and not just, not just like, you know, when it comes to their, the X's and O's of training, right. How to, you know, what their, what their squat stance looks like, but like their life, you learn things about these people and not only does it help you with your day to day, like you're, you just enjoy your life more, but the business from a business standpoint, you can tell it benefits greatly. And in business, you know, the scorecard, the report card, the measure of success is going to be the bank account. 
It's revenue, it's dollars and cents. There's some folks that all they focus on is the money. And there's some folks that think it's absolutely terrible to focus on the money. But at the end of the day, you can't provide for your family if you're not making money and you can't pay your staff. The more you invest in those relationships without making the money the focus, the money shows up. The more time we spend, and I used to teach this to my staff, especially at, at the end, like we want to over deliver. We always want to over deliver. We want them to be happy. And even if they're going to be somebody, they're a paying customer today and their term agreement, the last seven, eight years, I own my brick and mortar. We only sold coaching training on term agreements, no sessions, no packs, none of that garbage. But even if they were going to expire tomorrow, we're going to over deliver today and we're going to over deliver the last day because they may come back. And the other thing is, I mean, it's a good human being thing to do. What's hard, I mean, right? this is easy stuff, you know, but not only uh, they might come back, right. That is it, it's happened. Actually, I just had a client return after like a, a two year hiatus, kind of this period had some life stuff going on. She came back and now she's already get this. She's already referring people. So yeah. not only are these, these people like you got to think of them, Hey, yeah, sure. Maybe their, their terms coming to an end and they're going to move on, do whatever they are going to do, but they might come back, but they're also going to tell people about you, about your business, about your gym, how you treat people is going to end up paying off over the long term, incredibly, it's crazy how it works. It really is. We, but it's we teach that we teach that to our business consulting clients. I call it walking billboard. That person is going to be a walking billboard for your business, and it's either going to be a positive billboard or it's going to be a negative. You best do the right things so that you create walking billboards that are going to be your biggest cheerleaders. Even if you know who knows, like things change, life changes, people come and go, and who knows what the reason that they're they're not going to renew is. It might might be a temporary reason. It might be a temporary life change or money change, and they might come back. Sometimes it's a great opportunity to have somebody leave and think the grass is greener on the other side of the proverbial fence. They've been paying Franklin Strength and Wellness, and it's time for them to make a decision about renewing. And they, they've got some friends and there's a new shiny object over here and, and they go check it out. And the place is underwhelming. They under deliver. They, it's dirty. They don't, there's no professionalism. Nobody He's checking in, reaching out, saying, Hey, Mary, how are you doing? Are you reaching your goals? Guess what? They're going to love you. They're going to mm-hmm. come back. That's funny. We, we were just talking about that last week. We were, we were just talk, had the same conversation, just talking about like, you know, it's okay that these people, uh, some of our people will leave and go try something new, right? Because people, like you said, uh, the new shiny, like we've got uh, F45 down here, right? People, people want to go try that out. Hey, have at it, right? It's not training. You're just getting hot and sweaty, but it, go enjoy that for what it is, but then come back come back when you're, when you're ready to do some actual training, right? Where we can monitor your progress over the course of time. And, and we, we actually know you as a person versus just you being a number. And that goes back to that relationship piece in the large national flag brands. So the large chains, which F45 would, would definitely today is and the large commercial gyms that offer training and coaching. There very few of them have the ability to invest time to build relationships with their members, customers, and clients. The facilities are too big. And in the smaller facilities, like an F45, for the most part, the coaching and training staff is transient. So they're here today, they're there for three or four months, and then they go back to college. They can't make any money. They don't see any opportunities. So they go get a new job. Here you are, you're 15 years deep, and you're still doing coaching and training. So if they leave this month, they come back next summer, you're still going to be there. Uh, When I started going to school, so the GI Bill paid for my school. And I was like, man, I really want to, I really want to teach, right? I really enjoyed teaching, right? So whether that was, you know, personal training, teaching in general. So I ended up going to school for health and physical education. So I taught for eight years. But in that time when I was teaching, I realized that, man, I'm not sure if I could do this for 30 years. At the same time, I I started uh, my own garage gym business right? Applying a lot of things that I learned from you. I was teaching full time. And then I had a successful garage gym business in a two car garage in a, in a village of 1800 people for all the business owners out or future business owners. Because I know there's a lot of people out there that just are afraid to make that leap. Well, sometimes you just got to try it out for yourself and see how it goes. Right. And for me, it was very low stakes. I was still getting a regular salary through my school teaching job. Right. And I started my business. Right. And then during that time, I'm like, man, Ray was, Ray was right. He really was right. I'm really enjoying this. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to go to grad school now not that this is a requirement for anything right but i went to grad school then for exercise physiology hell the military was going to pay for it so i'm going to do it so i was keeping you in the back of my mind this whole time so i'm starting this little garage gym business i'm still teaching even though you told me i shouldn't teach i'm doing this garage gym business which i what i really enjoyed teaching was great i was still doing some barbell training there and stuff and then here we are today 
what is it, October 31st of 2022, right? Yeah. Probably about 10 years, 10, 12 years after the fact, you told me not to get the teaching, but here I am. All comes full, full well, circle, right? If I look at the last few months, I've talked to like 80 coaches, trainers, and gym owners. What I know for a fact is most of them are doing it part-time. Almost all of them suffer from a lack of business experience. They don't have any systems. They don't have any of the tools in the toolbox that they need to be successful. Now, in your case, you had some systems and you had enough revenue that you really didn't need the teaching job. And, and that's why I told you like, dude, you don't need to teach. Like you're, you're making it. Even for people that have some of the tools in the toolbox, it's still kind of scary to walk away from a paycheck. Um, I also think it is a good thing though for, you know, like you said, a lot of these trainers are part-time. I think it is important, even if you're not quite ready, you just need to go full-time because you have to make it then. You have to, it's either make or break. So you have to right. make enough money. It's an incentive for you to make more money then. You can attract more clients. You're going to work harder. You're going to hustle a little bit more. And over the course of time, that'll build up and you'll have, a, you'll have a great salary. It'll force you to get serious about setting your own goals for business revenue and then actually working towards them, which eventually will lead to having to have more tools in your toolbox, having to have some business systems so that you can start behaving like a real business. How often as a business, do you set goals for the business? You know, you mentioned revenue per client, which is a big one for those coaches, trainers, and gyms. You should know what your revenue per training client is. What metrics, like what are the key numbers you guys look at? We look at the average revenue per member, right? And we mentioned that earlier. Let's say we've got some small group training clients paying $199 a month. And then we've got some PT clients paying $900 a month. That's going to, that $900 a month PT client is going to increase the average revenue per member because you're averaging it out. It doesn't matter. A bunch of group clients paying one and nine. If you get a quite a handful of uh, people paying, you know, six, seven, eight, nine hundred dollars, thousand dollars, it adds up. When we get a lead and we might have very few leads, we might have, we might have two leads and those leads better be sure to, to, to make the most out of them. I had a lead weekend and she booked a free intro call. We're going to do our free intro call today. If we're the right fit for her and she's the right fit for us, we're going to uh, schedule her onboarding sessions, right? Which are effectively four one-on-one -on -one personal training sessions. And then she does a, uh, a nutrition onboarding session as well over the phone. Then we can convert her into, or recommend she goes either into personal training, semi-private or small group. So what I'm saying is the leads matter, right? Especially for businesses like us that are really small in a saturated market, everyone matters. Every every lead counts. So we, we track leads. Like you need to know how many leads are coming in. You need to have a system to attract more leads. And then you need to understand how many leads become paying customers. So like for, for me, I close seven out of 10 people that came in and inquired about training signed up. And for our staff, because I built a system, I took what I did and turned it into a system so I could teach any of the staff that was going to do that job could do the same thing. It's kind of like making a happy meal. That's always the analogy. I use <laughs> McDonald's. McDonald's makes happy meals and they're super simple. It's a cute box, a burger, fries, a toy, a drink. And if you ask for apple slices, you still get the fries because they don't disturb the system. The system works. So I systemized what we did with leads and our staff closed 6.6 .6 to 6.7 out of 10. So if they're at 66, 67% closing rate. I was at 70. I I'll give up the 3%. Then I can go home and have time with my kids. For the business owners, our hopeful business owners, coaches, and trainers, you need to know how many leads you get every week or every month. And then the next piece is you need to know your closing percentage. Do you know what your closing percentage is? And I would say the average would be right around there, like 65%, something around there, 70%, which is still pretty good. If seven out of 10 people come in and they're paying, you know, average revenue per member around three hundred and thirty dollars recurring right every month pretty good for a small business and a thousand square feet 60 percent you can expect to be able to teach your staff and lead your staff to do people that are good are going to close 70 you're not going to get much higher than that because every market with fitness is saturated it doesn't matter where you are there there's so few barriers to entry so you have a system to bring leads in and then somebody's looking at the numbers and then you also have a system in regards to what you do with the leads which is that onboarding process so you guys have, you're, you're investing time and you said what, four workouts, a call for nutrition, and then an initial yeah, so, call as well, right? Yeah. The initial call is the, is the most important one of it all, because that's, that really gives you the opportunity to uh, learn about that uh, potential client and what, what they want to get out of this experience. Right. But also if we're, the, we're, if we're going to be the right fit for them, if they're coming to us, maybe a kid who wants to do some hardcore, like soccer conditioning, well, we're not the right place for them.
but maybe I can I recommend recommend a, a, a place that would be good for them. They start off with that intro call and that's usually a great conversation. And I, I love them. That's probably one of my favorite parts of my jobs because these people, nobody, people do not know anything about fitness, Ray. And you, they don't know anything about fitness and they don't know much about nutrition either. So that's our, that's our job. We teach people that we're teachers, right? So they, they then come in and do those onboarding sessions, which is a great way to teach them kind of from the ground up. And we have these structured onboarding sessions that they go through, teaching them the main lifts, main barbell lifts. And then as the sessions progress, we introduce some different accessory pieces. They're learning and they're seeing the value in their service. So then at the end of their onboarding, they're going to be like, okay, yeah, sign me up. What, what do you think is going to be the best bet for me? So not only they're coming in right away, their onboarding package is $400. They're investing in themselves by paying you $400 for those, for those five, essentially five sessions, right? Four sessions and a nutrition uh, session. So it's like, they're already in, man, they're in. And if they're not in, they're not the right people for you. That's okay. There's so much value. I would say it's gold, not saying we can train the soccer player kid and then also saying we're not the club for everybody that was probably like looking back that that was my struggle we we had a 15,000 plus square foot commercial gym plus all the training we did and you know within that there were eight showers a bunch of toilets all that stuff needed to be cleaned you got to buy toilet paper you got to buy hand soap and then all of the members which we averaged like 1200 members most of them were never going to be a customer for for the service we sold, but they took a lot of time away from the service we sold. And really the money that we, like our profit was tied to service. Even when I sold the gym, I told everybody that was interested in buying it, you need to understand this business operates as a service business that also has a commercial gym. If you focus on being a gym, you will not make it. Like you have to be good at service. And you guys are smart enough to know, again, being clear on, on what you're going to focus on, being clear on who your customers are. We don't train kids like kids that are looking to be better at travel soccer. That's not it. And you're right, okay right. telling somebody, Hey, we're not a good fit. That's so valuable. So valuable. The kids that we do train, uh, we focus on strength and hypertrophy, right? So, I mean, not even hyper, I mean, we basically focus on strength, right? Then uh, a byproduct of that is sometimes they'll put on a little bit of muscle mass, right? <laughs> they don't right. have enough, you know, they don't, they don't have enough hormones rocking for that. But, you know, as far as doing what, you, doing what your specialty is, man, it's such a relief to like, you know, when people reach out for you and they know that you do strength, well, that's, you know, that's what they're going to expect versus back when we were strength and con Franklin strength and conditioning. Well, then we were expected to introduce different conditioning pieces so yeah we did get people hot and sweaty pushing sleds which is fun and doing some ski ergs and rowing and stuff like that but did, did i enjoy it or did my coaches enjoy it not necessarily right because we're in it for the we're in it for the the strength game right and the hypertrophy game so that's what we found the most value in you know as far as training ourselves so that's it's it's cool in having those other things really are a distraction and they just steal time from what your core business is which is that strength piece you know a lot of businesses miss it i mean totally different industry but i talked to a business owner they do nine figures in revenue so people do the you know that's north of 100 million a year in revenue they continued to downsize what they offered and they limited things, stuff they'd done for like decades so that they can focus on their core competency. And the more they focused on the core competency, two things happened. One, their revenue went up and two, they were able to invest more in their employees. So it's win-win. The employees yeah. are happier. They're making more money. They're not, like you said, they're not doing the stuff they don't like doing. And annual revenue kept, I think, 20% year to year growth. It's huge. Less is more, right? Yep, absolutely. And that's, you know, over and over again, I see that people, regardless of industry that define a niche and go deep in that niche and just focus on that end up being the most successful. You can pick, you just go look at YouTube. There's a YouTube channel on everything under the sun selling wise. So you guys have three products. So we have four. Yeah. Um, so we've got the one-on-one, -on -one, we got the semi-private small group, and then our youth strong program. And then I guess the fifth, our fifth product would be our nutrition coaching service. So we have five products. You mentioned selling. How do you guys sell them or how do you discount them? Or Yeah. So um, as far as selling goes, that all generally is going to happen either during that free intro call at the beginning or sometime during the onboarding sessions or immediately after the onboarding. So 
Uh, by that time, we'll know, hey, what, what's going to be a great fit for them. And, and then and then we sell it, just price things accordingly. You yeah. guys ever discount? Oh, yeah. It's, that's, uh, I actually had a, a list of uh, just a couple notes on here. One thing that I've learned over the years, and I learned this back in my, my garage gym business days, is do not do discounts. And there's so many in the fitness industry that just think that they need to discount their services for whatever, whatever that person is. Listen. I'm a military vet. I like my, my Lowe's discount of 10% because it saves me on taxes. You know, when it comes to discounting your services, well, you're just shooting yourself in the foot, okay? If you priced your pricing accordingly and you're gonna attract the right people to you, right? There's no need to discount. These, these people wanna pay you more because you're, you're providing them such a high value service. They don't, they don't even, the people that are right for your business aren't gonna ask you for a discount, okay? The ones that do ask you for a discount, immediate, <laughs> immediate red flag but try not to be a jerk in return because they might, you know, it just might be something they ask. For example, I had a guy call the other day. He, he accidentally booked a call with me and he was actually trying to uh, set up a membership at Lifetime Fitness. I don't know how he got me <laughs> and Lifetime uh, mixed up. And I figured this out right from the get-go, but he, he, did, he did ask if we had any senior discounts, you know? I said, no, we don't offer discounts. I said, everybody pays the same rate and get the same value of service. But yeah, do not discount your service. That's one of the biggest uh, takeaways from this conversation we're having right now is for business owners not to discount their services. Why? Your, ter your time is worth money, right? And you have to pay the overhead of the business. You have to pay your staff. You have to pay insurance, all this stuff. So you need, to, you need to price it accordingly. I steal this, stole it from my business coach, Thomas Plummer. You know, he said, don't discount incentivize. We shifted 10 years ago, we stopped doing a discount and we, we just changed. We still provided extra value, but we didn't reduce the cost to do it. And the problem with discounts is if your training is $200 a month, it's $199 a month and they can come all they want. If you give it to them at $99 for a month, well, you just taught them that it's really only worth $99. They're never going to be okay with paying you $199. And believe me, I tried it. I tried it for a lot of years. All it does is people will harbor some subconscious animosity towards you because they're going to be mm -hmm. like, well, he used to sell this to me for 99 and now I've got to pay 199. And I don't think that's right because it's the same thing that I got for 99. So why do I got to pay the 199? You have to be willing to value yourself the way I remember it. Some Earl Nightingale said, I, I bargained with life for a penny and a penny is all that I got. And Earl didn't say it. There's some other guy, it's his quote, and that's not the exact way it goes, but that's the way I remember it. Well, if you don't think you're worth $199 a month, no one's going to pay you that. But if you think and know you're worth $199, then go ask for it. Right. It's what you said. The people that value what you do, they're happy to pay it. Yeah. And not everybody can afford your service either. You got to realize that. So like, you know, let's say I've got people coming in and they want, they want personal training, right? But they don't realize how much personal training actually costs because you're literally in a personal personalized setting, personalized programming, one-on-one. -on -one, right? That's taking up a chunk of your time that you could be making money doing right. other things too. So I know it's bad to say, but you can't help everybody, right? Not everybody's going to be able to afford your service and you just have to be okay with it. I, I was much like you at one point. It's like, I wanted to help everybody, you know, even no matter what their, their goals were, I wanted to try to help them. I can't, man, because then I'm, I feel like I'm kind of lying, lying to myself because I can't, you know, I'm not a, a conditioning specialist. Yeah, I've ran some a marathon, some half marathons, but that doesn't mean I'm a specialist, right? I mean, I just went out there and, you know, I ran slow for four hours. <laughs> Gutted your way through it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You finished. But I did strength training to get prepared for it. So that, hey, that's that's a, a constant, you know, variable there. It's like, oh, wow, this strength training thing's pretty important, eh? The more we try and be all things, all people, the more you dilute the value you can deliver to your core business. So if your core business is strength training, the more you try and do all these other things, the more it takes away from what your core business is. And that that was my problem. A few hundred people a day come in and probably 30% of that 200 and some shower. They got to get cleaned every day. Well, we don't make any right. money cleaning showers. It takes time and resources away from delivering coaching and training. And at the end of the day, I didn't want to clean showers. Nobody on the staff wanted to clean showers, but we all had to clean showers. Note to self, if you ever do this again, don't have showers. Like yeah, you don't, we don't sell have showers. showers. <laughs> like, yeah, it's funny. People ask us, hey, do you guys have showers? Nope. Uh, no, we don't have showers. I'm sorry. But, but you know, I'd say 90% of the time, it's not an issue, especially with this. Ever since, you know, we've changed kind of some of our work schedules as far as people People working from home and stuff yeah. the last couple of years. It's definitely been more helpful for people to get their training in because, hey, I might work from home a couple of days a week. I can get my training in 
Uh, I can go train with Chris and his crew there. No problem. I can work it in my day now versus being stuck in an office five days a week. Right? And the, you know, the other thing is, I don't know what it is now, but it used to be like a one shower build out was like 10 or 12,000 bucks. So, you know, you, you look at your capital for those of you that are looking to get into a brick and mortar space. When you start looking at allocation of capital and borrowing money, spending some of your own money, you know, real quick, your locker rooms are can, are, can consume north of a hundred thousand dollars for what you don't make any money at it. Like, like that was mine. Like we don't sell showers. It's a headache. It's just a headache. It, is. it creates a it's... headache because pe- people have something to complain about or whatever. It right. Be, you know, and it's usually the people that are the lowest ever, <laughs> the lowest paid members. You know, it's like, oh, you, you guys are just paying for your your uh, membership for access at this facility, and you're the ones with the most problems versus my personal training clients and small group clients. They're yes. all paying. You know, and that goes back to understanding what your core business is and being willing to say no to things that aren't your core business because they all of that time with the quote unquote other customers, you know, people just renting use of the gym on a monthly basis. They, they take time away from the staff. They take resources away. They take capital away. They're most likely to negatively pa- impact the culture, the morale of the facility. And all of that is a negative for that core business. Interesting that you guys have evolved from that Franklin strength and conditioning to Franklin strength and wellness. And you, you kind of have kept saying, no, we're, this is what we do. So yeah, if you want that, we don't do that. Like, yeah, it's it was not, a, it was it's a not big, us. It was a big, it was a big transition because we did have a a pretty good size membership base. When we transitioned to our our new business model with and we increased our rates, that was one of the most important things that we ever did. But it was also one of the most difficult because you know here I am, I'm running this facility, I've got my coaches under me, I know everybody at that facility, explaining them why we had to raise their rates so that we can actually have a sustainable business and and create careers for our staff members. It it didn't matter to people because the people that were paying those discounted rates or, you know, they're paying anywhere between 99 and 119 bucks a month. We explained to them in the next year, hey, we're going to, we're going to ramp your um, payment up for group classes to 199 a month. You know, we just had to pull the bandaid off. And we lost almost everybody, Ray. It was unbelievable. These people that I that I really cared for, and they cared for me, so I thought it didn't matter. They 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 were like, oh, it comes down to the money, and if if they're not, uh, they weren't willing to pay one ninety nine. They were gone. That's fine. I had to kind of I had to grow through that. It was tough for me mentally, you know, just like, you know, I'm thinking these people are gonna hate me, blah blah blah, but. It was the best thing we could do for our business because now all the people that we have, they're all wonderful human beings. They're the right people. They're the right people. They're paying us what we're worth. We got through that hard, hard point, but we did basically come back down to not zero members, but we had like a a couple handfuls of people left after the whole, (laughs) it was unbelievable. It really was. So it's like, oh, well, here's where we're at. So now we just kind of make a joke about it because now everything is so much better. Uh, We've got all brand new equipment. It's freaking beautiful in there. And we were able to invest back in the business. That's a hard thing. Like I, I've talked to a number of people the last couple of weeks that are in a position, they need to raise what they're charging and they don't know how, and they're scared. It's this easy. Like you're, you're here to make money, not friends. And that doesn't mean that we don't build those relationships, but you have to make money or you can't pay your rent for your facility. You have to make money or when it's time to replace the equipment, you can't, you have to make money or when you've got a stellar standout coach. They need to earn more money. You can't pay them. And you have to get comfortable with the idea that a lot of the people that are there because it's cheap are going to leave, but they'll get replaced with the right people. And, and you're right proof people, of that. The, yeah. The right people won't even know what they, the, what they used to pay back in the no. day. It doesn't matter. Nope. So all these new people coming in, did we, did we have a $400 onboarding process a year ago? No. Right. It was like a $180 process, right? Now it's a $400 process because we got our, our ducks in a row, right? But did they ever know it was $180 onboarding? No, it doesn't matter. It's from this day forward is what matters. Yep. And then all, the, all those people that, yeah, you're going to impact some people when you raise your prices and it, it is tough, but you'll be surprised at, uh, at, at some of the support you will get from, even if a lot of people leave, a lot of people will support you and you're, you know, and they, they want to pay you money because you're providing this valuable service for them. The more you become a true niche, you'll have a tribe of people that are out there looking for you and you won't have to spend time marketing and advertising to a bunch of maybe customers only to find out they're not going to become customers because they don't, they don't value what you do. No, I think, I think the approach is right that you guys have taken and in the proofs in the pudding, you guys are paying your bills. You moved to a new facility, you got new equipment. So clearly raising the prices is worked out. A-okay. 
What do you think your top three biggest piece of ad- pieces of advice would be? I'd say one of my top things would be to build and nurture these relationships with not only your staff and your clients. And we talked a little bit about that earlier because if you want to have a successful business, you've got to have staff that enjoy their jobs and are compensated well but then they also do a great job at their job. And your clients, you need to build and kind of nurture those relationships because those are the people that are, like you said, you're walking billboards. So uh, something that I can definitely recommend alongside that is ask your clients for reviews and don't do it don't do it at the end of your service. Let's say they're, uh, you can do it at the end of their service when they're, when they're getting ready to move on. I've done that often. A lot of the times we'll have a good, a positive experience in the gym. I'll say, Hey, would you mind leaving a quick Google review for us? I just tell them you couldn't even imagine how much that helps us. Cause people actually re- read these Google reviews. Don't be afraid to ask for reviews. The second must do would be to have these uh, consistent and simple systems in place. So don't make a system where it's so complex that you can't even follow through with it or your staff can't. It needs to be simple enough to where, we know, we know exactly what to do and what needs to be happen, but it's repeatable, right? It's simple, it's repeatable, and it's consistent. So like uh, just a, one example, we teach our barbell lifts, our barbell movements, and we use the starting strength methodology to teach it, right? So we teach the deadlift the exact same way based on a model, okay? That way, all of our coaches teach the deadlift the exact same way. Is that pretty consistent in systems? Yeah. So that means if you onboard, if Ray comes in and onboards with me, or one of my other two coaches, it doesn't matter. They're going to receive that same level of coaching um, and cueing and, and teaching from that, that coach. And then obviously anything, any other system you could think of, if your your cancellation policies, your whatever, whatever kind of system you want to uh, implement, just make sure it's uh, simple and consistent so that not just you can do it, but everybody else can do it. Third and final would be semi-private training is greater than personal training. As far as you can help more people in the same amount of time, but you get paid a lot more. The personal training session in Franklin, Tennessee is $80 an hour. Well, my semi-private, so I, I can have anywhere between one and three people during that block of time. They pay a discounted rate without discounting it, $60. So that means you're making $180 in that hour, right? And the coach get paid, gets paid half. As a coach, you're making $90 an hour if you can build up that semi-private group. So it's an incentive for you to build it up. Personal training is great. There's some people that just only want to do one-on-one and that's fine. But if you can structure part of your day to include semi-private training, I would definitely recommend it. Whether you're in a yoga studio, a kettlebell studio, a barbell studio, whatever you want to do. Okay. Semi-private training is huge. We would have build relationships and ask for reviews, develop simple systems. I love it. That's my happy meal example that I've (laughs) used in, I don't know how many seminars, webinars, consulting calls, like make, make it simple. And the best example of a simple systems is, is a McDonald's Happy Meal. And then your third one is revenue per hour. You know, how do you generate more revenue per hour? You nailed it. Instead of training one person per hour, we now have the capacity to train three. And it's win, win, win for everybody. The coach wins. It's an opportunity to earn more. The client wins because they can enjoy a lower price point. There's some clients that the one-on-one experience is outside of their budget. And then there's some clients that do better in a group. So I, I love all three of those. Those are those those are three winners. Th- those are the things that a-, a business does. And we don't see a lot of people in the fitness space doing. What about three top three don't do's? Don't do everything yourself. You can't do everything yourself because you're going to burn out. There's tons of things that go on. For example, cleaning and programming. If you're program, you know, having uh, consistent group programming for your group classes, there's coaching, there's personal training, there's semi-private training, there's intro calls, there's goal reviews, whatever, whatever you want to, whatever you may be, right? You can't do everything. It's a, it's a lot of work, right? So you need to find the right people, put them in the right place and then have them uh, help out with a lot of these things. So like, for example, I'm to the point now where I'm not doing the cleaning. I'm not doing the programming. I am coaching some, I am personal training some, I'm still doing the intro calls and then I'm splitting up the, the goal reviews. So I'm doing a lot less work. Another don't do is don't price your services off of your budget or what you think people are willing to pay for your service. So, for Oh example, yeah, that's gold. I, Go ahead. Yeah. So I train a lot of people that are millionaires, right? Their budget is a little different than mine. My wife is a teacher. I'm a trainer, right? We're not making millions of dollars and that's okay. If I price my services off of what my, bu- my budget was, well, then I would probably make a lot less per hour because I can't afford an $80 a session, personal training session. Don't, don't price it off of based on, on what you think people's budgets are and you're going to attract the right, the right people. Like we talked about earlier that are willing to pay for what you're worth. We talked about, you can't help everybody. Right. And that's, that comes in, in this scenario as well. You know, people want personal training, right? That's awesome. So they're going to, they're going to pay you for your service that you're providing them, but your buddy down the road might not be able to afford personal training. So you just, 
you know, you can't help them in, in a, from a business standpoint. You can't service them at your, your um, facility unless he was able to afford a, a, a discounted rate of uh, coming in and doing your small group training, right? Because right. we don't actually, right. dis- we don't, we don't discount our rates. And my final don't, don't do, don't do discounts. Like I said earlier, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. Like I think that discounts are one of the worst things fitnesses, fitness industry or fitness businesses can do. I mean, it, it just, it just really screws you in the end. And I think all, all three of those are, are good examples of things we, we shouldn't be doing. Your point number two is, is interesting. And I used to have to spend time in our, our business development meetings, as I call them with our staff, don't decide what somebody can or can't afford. You may, or we may, or I may think it's a lot of money, but to somebody that it's the most important thing for whatever reason, if it's the most important thing in the world to them for whatever reason, and they don't have the money and they're going to put it on their credit card and pay 19% interest on it. Obviously it's important. Don't, Right. Don't decide it's too expensive because you don't know what the reason is to be doing it. And if it's that important to them, take their money, sign them up, over deliver. The other thing that I saw with, with staff was I would have to remind them like our clients come in because we're the experts and they're not. That average person that comes in to be onboarded, they know none of that stuff. What else for today? What else would you add? All right, man. First off, I want to, I just want to say thanks for having me on that. I really enjoyed our call. You actually, uh, we, were, we were talking last week on the phone and uh, in the middle of my squat session. So that was, that was cool. <laughs> That's always good to hear, hear me grunt a little bit while I'm squatting. No, man. Um, I really think that like, as far as the getting into the fitness industry, it is, it is a little um, overwhelming at first. Uh, there's a lot, a lot that you have to factor in, but once you just start doing it right and, and continue to build your business, building your systems. And I'm still, uh, I'm still going through these things, right? I'm still building, building systems and, and improving things along the way, but like, man, it gets a whole heck of a lot easier. Right. Uh, for example, when I get off the call with you today, I'm going to go work out. Right. I've got a nice, nice little garage gym set up because I live 40 minutes away from my, my, you know, my business. I'm going to work out, got a little intro call. I'm going to mulch some leaves this afternoon. So it's a, it's a great life, but like, you know, then there's certain days of the week where I'm just grinding, you know, I'm personal training, I'm semi-private, I'm coaching classes. It's a lot of fun. If you don't enjoy um, helping people, if you don't enjoy training yourself, then this probably isn't the right, right fit for you. And you might need to find something else and that's okay, but you need to figure that out before you really dive in. Selfishly for me, the reason I'm doing these calls is in these webcasts and these podcasts with people is this, there are so many passionate people that want to help others with health, wellness, weight loss, fitness, but they don't have the tools. And I, I'm going to say to anybody that's made it all the way through the podcast today, there's stuff that Chris is doing this for real. He's in one of the probably most competitive markets in the country. Yes, they've got high income. They have a high culture that from a value of, of health standpoint, there's a lot of competition and the clients in that market have a lot of options and they're demanding clients. Chris has been successful and there's a lot of stuff you shared over the last hour. It may sound really easy and simple, but it's stuff that's taken you three, four years to learn. Some of it, it took me like 10 years to learn and apply in my mm-hmm. business. Like if you want to be successful, you want to move from being a part-time coach or trainer, or you're a small training gym that's struggling, barely covering your overhead every month. You can take what Chris talked about, plug it into your business and you will be more successful. It's validated. He's doing it. Right. And And I think that's, yeah, that's, that's huge. And for, for example, you helped me, helped me a lot over the years. People don't realize how helpful having a, uh, having a mentor, a business mentor, especially can be until you actually try it out. So for example, if people were to hire you to help them with their business, that front end investment is going to pay dividends over the course of their time, instead of trying to figure it out, (laughs) figure it out on the road, because it's tough. You know, if, if you would have told me small group, semi, semi private, any of that stuff would work and make money. I said, no, up until tail end of the recession, I did most of our training. Most of our training was one-on-one. I had a number of trainers and coaches that, that did one-on-one, but I I spent like 40 or 50 hours a week doing one-on-one training. Yeah. We made money. It was highly profitable, but it meant I got to work at five in the morning and I didn't leave till late at night. We changed the model, which I didn't believe in. I didn't buy into having my sales off $50,000 kind of forced my hand at this. I hired the most expensive consultant in the industry. And he was like, you're doing all these things really well, but you're missing a big piece. 
And, and he basically said, here's how you do this in a group environment. I was like, holy cow. And then pretty soon I was only training three or five hours a week. I was able to hire staff and, and I had a system so that they delivered a consistent experience. I love what you said about, was it starting strength on teaching the barbell lifts, like the deadlift? Mm -hmm. Everybody does it the same way. Like I was able to do that. So now I could quote unquote duplicate myself. Everybody could get the same experience and it didn't require me being there and it took off, but it, it took me hard. Hiring, you know, like being in a really bad financial spot and hiring a consultant to say, well, one, you don't have a choice, but to try what I'm going to tell you. But two, like, right. listen, this is proven out. It works. Just do it this way. And it was like, oh my God. And our training revenue just kept going up and I was spending less time working. And that's, uh, you know, there, it's not like I have some secret or, or whatnot. It's just, I made enough mistakes. I've learned some things that work. I, like I'm taking stuff away from chatting with you today. Like the paid for onboarding is is brilliant. It's brilliant because it's that we try, we did the onboard onboarding, but it was just part of what they got. Right. And that meant a lot of people didn't show up. Yeah. <laughs> if, if they spend the money, they're coming, they're showing up. And the other thing is if they don't want to spend the money, well, they're probably not your customer today, right? They're probably not, they're probably not signing up. So maybe, maybe in six months they will, and they'll be back and they're going to do it. But I, I think that paid for onboarding is brilliant. I like yeah, that. Uh, yeah, I, I like it too. So, you know, one of the, one of the big benefits of it though, not just financially, it's um, it really allows us to show them that we are the professionals, right? And yeah. here's why, right? So we're running running them through these onboarding sessions. They're very scripted out, right? They like come in and and part of it is like, okay, you know, day one onboarding, you take a picture of them in front of the logo so that we can use it at a later date so we can compare it after their 90 day uh, goal review. Um, it's very system systemized, systematized, right? That would be the word. And um, as far as, you know, them, their actual experience, they leave that first onboarding session knowing that, man, these guys know their stuff. I can't wait for onboarding number two. They come to onboarding number two, they leave again. They're like, God, you guys continue to impress me. They come to three and four and they're like, okay, I'm ready to sign up because they've showed me four different times, not including the nutrition call that these guys are the people for me. And if we're not, so be it. You can go to lifetime or whatever. It doesn't We'll slow the process down. We want that new person that lead that prospect to come in. One, we want them to see us as professionals. And two, we want to spend more time with them than anybody in the fitness industry ever has for a number of reasons. One, we don't know where they are on their fitness journey, their exercise journey, their workout journey, their strength training journey. And the reality of it is a lot of them don't know either. So right. we need to make sure that we learn something about them. We know where they are and we can plug them into the right spot of our training. And then also we want to make sure they know what's going on, make sure they know how to properly squat or deadlift. Or, or whatever the movement pattern mm -hmm. is. And then from a marketing standpoint, the gym down the street wasn't going to do that. We were. The other training gyms that were opening up at the time, were they going to do that? No. Some of them are now. Where'd they get the idea? They copied it from me because <laughs> it worked, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, the, you know, that person that's going to go over to Lifetime, if, if they're out shopping gyms and they come check you out, maybe they only do the onboarding. So you get your phone call, you get your four visits, never goes any further. If they end up at a big box gym, they're never going to have that experience. Like they're, but, maybe they, but maybe they learn something. Well, they definitely learn, learn something that they could potentially apply at, the, at their, you know, right. but so they did, they did want to attend a box gym. Well, at least now they know how to deadlift and and overhead press and bench and squat, right? But yep. then you don't then you don't have that constant refining from you know the, from the coaching process. Like, hey, you're not gonna have a coach there, right? So you don't you don't know if you're gonna continue to do it well as you add a uh, load to the bar. But um, some people, it is what it is, you know. And that's that's a huge opportunity for the industry. I I know one guy that runs his gym different, and he's doing these things. But when you sign up for a membership somewhere, most people don't know what they're doing. So they walk in, come to the front counter, some high school or college age kid signs them up, says, here's your membership card. There's the locker room. There's the cardio. There's the weight. That person, they could be 48 years old and have never exercised before. What the hell are they going to do with all of that cardio, free weights? They can figure the locker room out because they got a shower at home. But but outside of that, they don't know what they're doing. And nobody nobody takes the time to show them. And I, I think your onboarding is, is brilliant. I think it does so much. One, like you said, if they end up at another gym, at least they've got a foundation the reality of it is you're doing a lot to set them up to be successful and increase the likelihood they sign up with you. I love yeah, it. For sure. That's good. Thank you. Well, I think that's good for today, man. If you like our content, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Leave us a comment below. Also, 
be sure to check us out on your favorite podcast provider 